You want to know a little pilot secret? It's not like I have a bomb in here. Hi, my name is Fatima Shafi. Fatima is a captain for a major U.S. commercial airline. She's also a former avionics engineering officer for the Pakistan Air Force. Today I'll be breaking down clips from movies and TV about flying. Overweight takeoff, American made. No mas, no mas, no mas. But there's plenty of room, gringo. No, 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 si, 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 hasta, no. hasta arriba, hasta arriba. Guys, guys, it ain't about room, all right? It's about weight. Just because there's empty room that you can see in the aircraft does not mean you can fill it up all the way to the brink. No mas. An aircraft, every time before it flies, is required to be checked for performance and weight and balance. You calculate a center of gravity for that particular flight, and you calculate how much weight you can carry in what part of the aircraft. The aircraft has to be within a certain operating envelope for it to conduct the entire flight safely. Oh, whoa. Where the hell you think you're going, big fella? Either I fly the big fella or I fly your product. Tom Cruise was correct in kick, kicking the guy out. He's probably also flying the aircraft further away, so he's carrying as much fuel as he can, maybe even more, to conduct a long flight. The depiction of an overweight takeoff they're doing is pretty much on point. He tries to lift off and the stall warning horn goes off. That stall warning horn is an indication that a stall is about to occur. He does not rush the takeoff, which is exactly what he should have done. When a stall occurs, there's just not enough airflow and the wing basically quits flying. He wants to get rid of the drag of the aircraft, so he lifts the landing gear up. Up until that point, I was with it. But then he's still stalling, which means he still doesn't have enough lift. The aircraft's still not ready to fly. You're forcing a takeoff, and then now you're hitting trees and you keep flying? <laughs> not very realistic. I do tend to leap before I look. Skylaw, 30 Rock. Stewart, 2118, that guy. Excuse me, Mr. Sweatpants. We're gonna need to check that bag. And that is Skylaw. No, there's no such thing as a Skylaw per se or codes that we use with flight attendants. As a matter of fact, most of the times, when we get on an aircraft to fly it, we're meeting the crew for the first time in our lives. Excuse me, young lady. Are you old enough to be traveling alone? So Matt Damon in this scene is acting all like, has all this authority as captain of the aircraft, is impressing Tina Fey. Roger that. And is wearing the wrong hat. He's the captain of the aircraft. He is wearing a co-pilot hat. You want to know a little pilot secret besides the fact that we get a discount at Sunglass Hut? Pilots get discounts at a lot of places. <laughs> Sunglass Hut at the airport is actually one of them, but pilots get pretty much discounted all the retail outlets and food um, stores, restaurants at the airport. Didn't they say half an hour over an hour ago? So the 30 minute rule. People are starting to get a little antsy back there. Yeah, it's going to be about another half hour. I wish I could say it never existed. However, I can now say with a lot of confidence and faith, looking into your eye, that we're not doing it anymore. The half hour thing, it's a trick. It's enough time so that people know they're gonna have to wait, but it doesn't upset them. And can you tell me when we might be in the air, Captain? Sure, in about a half an hour. So when I, as a captain, give out any information, it is pretty much exactly what I know. Oh, folks, half an hour means forever. Oh. Bird strike. Sully. Well, you know the only way to get out of the water. Yeah, what's that? Fly to JFK. <laughs> the flight attendant's complaining about how awful LaGuardia is is very accurate. The nickname for LaGuardia in the industry is La Garbage. Funny. <laughs> A lot of reasons that LaGuardia is hated are the, the similar reasons why most passengers don't like it either. It's 
An airport that's overgrown its capacity. A little bit of weather causes extensive delays. Once you've landed, the taxi times could be up a few hours. Go easy. I love LaGuardia. My favorite airport in the whole white world is LaGuardia. Nothing on fuel quantity verified. 19,000 pounds required. We got 21 plane on board. 19,000 pounds required, 21 plane on board. The pilot and co-pilot, when they're taking the runway, that conversation that's happening is not conversation. It's not talking. It's pure business. Oh. It's called a sterile flight deck. Pilots cannot talk to each other, have any conversation that's not about the particular flight they're flying until the aircraft is above 10,000 feet. It may seem like, why is there a need for two people to say the same thing? 19,000 pounds required, we got 21 plane on board. 19,000 pounds required, 21 plane on board. The first officer who's the pilot flying calls out, 19,000 pounds required, 21.8 on board. The captain verifies it. It's called a takeoff fuel or minimum takeoff fuel for that matter. Birds. Whoa. The aircraft is designed to withstand a certain limit or number of bird strikes. There's no hard and fast limit for it, but it's not like the engine, just one small bird will bring the airplane down. Get out the QRH. Loss of thrust on both engines. QRH is the quick reference handbook. Any abnormal situation is handled by the QRH. It's like a cookbook. It is the step by step by step what to do. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Cactus 1549. We hit birds. Once an aircraft says Mayday, he owns everything. Every help is available to him. Teterboro Tower, I need a runway. Cactus 1549 needs to go to the airport right now. Newark Tower, what have you got? You have runway 29 cleared and ready. Uh, you need emergency landing? Yes. They're giving him every option. They stop the airspace. They give him every airport, every runway that's available to him. Then they'll tell you everything they know that will help you make a good decision. Cactus 1549, turn right 280. You can land runway one Teterboro. We can, thank you. If you look at this flight, everything that has happened in it was very good, with superior airmanship as we call it. And that's why it led to the result that it did. They followed all the right steps that should have been followed. Admission start, I'm starting to hear you. And you see the result that came out of it. Emergency landing, Con Air. We got one engine shot to shit, zero fuel, and we're dropping too fast. Strip's where I'm gonna land. Only the word is crash. Landing on the Las Vegas Strip, bad idea. Out of all the places in Las Vegas, what they could have picked, Strip was the worst. They were insane. Being a pilot is not just physically flying the aircraft. A lot of it is the decision making. The Las Vegas airport. It's just past the strip. Can you see it? Well, even Las Vegas. So right at this spot where they are, they're pretty much lined up with McCarran Airport. It's right there, man. You can make it. So if they're facing west in that shot, McCarran Airport has two runways, runway 19 left and 19 right, which is just to their left. All they had to do was make a left turn and they had a straight shot to that runway. As soon as they hit that guitar of the Hard Rock Cafe, they lose half their wing. They actually lose an aileron, which is a control surface that controls the roll movement of an aircraft, the roll movement with the this movement of the aircraft. If they lose the left aileron on the left part of the wing, that should be the end of that flight. The airplane should not be able to maintain level flight after that. It should go into a roll right away. Landing on the Las Vegas Strip was the worst of the ideas a pilot could make. Oh, shucks. Air traffic control, Saturday Night Live. All right. No, there's no tech talk for Monica's big man. I know you're coming out of Peely Wally up there, but I'm going to have you doing in your skate faster than a whippy gets a hard on, okay? <laughs> what? English is English, but it comes with all kinds of accents from all over the world. One of the harder ones is actually Scottish's heart. I'm so sorry, your accent is very thick. 
is it possible to not have it over? You can also ask them to repeat, but there's only so many times you can ask them to repeat before annoying them. What's it coming in at? And it, it, they can also be busy, so it's not like you can just like ask for them to repeat everything. Have a wee shove to you at the window doing it a grunt. Tell me if you can rest your goggles upon Ockintosh and Plane Station. The instructions are standardized. I'm expecting a certain type of instruction is about to come. Every instruction usually contains a heading, altitude, or a speed. I have an idea what's coming, but if it was actual legit aviation instructions coming, I probably would have been able to understand it. I should be able to understand it. What? So I am speaking as if, with the perspective of being an American person going into other countries, but I have heard a lot of complaints from foreign pilots that when they come to New York, especially Kennedy, they have the hardest time with air traffic control for two reasons. One, it's American English. Second, New Yorkers speak really fast. And third, JFK or New York airspace is one of the most complicated airspace systems in the world. They're dealing with a lot of traffic and the, the operation is very fast. So all that is, is difficult to understand. Say again? Loss of flight control. Flight. As soon as the aircraft goes in a nosedive, the aircraft starts screaming, whoop, whoop, pull up. That doesn't happen at high altitudes. That is a system in aircraft that stops it from impact when it is close to ground or close to structures or close to terrain. At 30,000 feet, the aircraft does not say pull up. It's just adding drama and chaos to the scene. We need to dump the fuel. Do it! Fuel dump is only on very large airplanes that carry fuel for hours and hours and hours. Domestic airplanes that have a range of four or five hours don't have fuel dumps on them. It's not like a light switch on and off. You turn the fuel dump on and all of a sudden the entire aircraft is out of fuel. It takes time. See if you can reach my side. Pilots are there to fly the aircraft. They can reach every switch and button from where they're sitting at their station buckled in. Stay strapped in, stay strapped in. Margaret! Margaret! They don't need Margaret to come for that manual control, which does not even exist on that aircraft. This movie was made post 9-11. In the United States, post 9-11, the flight deck door is not open. The flight attendant is not going in and out, just like it's a walk in the park. Oh Lord Jesus, we're burning! Hey, listen, we're level, we can maintain altitude like this. We're losing oil pressure for failure, both engines! We're all right, we're flying. Fire the left engine! Put it out. Let's talk about that fire. The first officer, in a very scared way, said, Oh my God, we have like the right engine on fire. Oh no, fire the right now! So he w goes ahead and pulls that one lever that's lit up all red. Once you pull that handle, you shut that engine off. Then, a few seconds later, the first officer, once again, all freaking out, says, oh, we just lost an engine. We lost the left engine. Of course you lost an engine, you just shut them off. There should be no power, there should be no electricity on the airplane, everything should go dark, they shouldn't be able to have any radio communication. The very next thing is he asked Margaret. Margaret, full power. You just shut those engines off. What are you adding power to? We're gonna roll it, okay? What do you mean roll it? We gotta do something to stop this guy. So this aircraft has a problem that it is in an uncontrolled nosedive situation. The captain decides to fly the aircraft and burn it so he can stop losing that altitude that they're losing extra fast. That makes sense. They go inverted, they arrest, they arrest the rate of descent by themselves time, that all is fine. But now when they come out of that inverted flight, they're back level again. We lost our power! How did the aircraft not go back into a nosedive right away? Are we gliding? Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. They have not fixed the problem. 
all that engine shutting down and the fire shutting down and all the, the drama that just happened has not corrected the problem. The problem still exists. This is a very peculiar situation, not something that you train for every day. Like a video game, right? But it has to have rhyme or reason and logic behind doing what you're doing, which does not exist in this scene. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Can't help you now, brother. Gunfight. Non-stop. So there's one gunshot fired, a bullet goes through the window of the aircraft, there's wind like there's a hurricane inside the cabin. One small bullet hole will not make so much wind and debris flying all over the, the cabin. The bullet hole was not enough to cause a rapid decompression in the cabin, but the loss of the window did. There's rapid decompression and the oxygen mass come down, which is a correct depiction. But how did the window just decide to fly out? There's no good reasoning behind that. 8,000 feet, come on, come on! Those panels are lifting up when the aircraft is going down or actually speed breaks. He is trying to get the airplane down fast in the shortest amount of time. 8,000! The maneuver they're showing is not coherent with that weightless situation. To get the aircraft weightless, you would actually do the opposite. You'd climb the aircraft when you reach the top of the climb. When you push back down is when you get weightless. Commercial airliners are not designed to be flown in a weightless situation. None of that should have happened. You're right. I failed. Unruly passenger. Meet the parents. You know what? Get your grubby little paws oh. off of my bag, okay? It's not like I have a bomb in here. It's not like I want to blow up the plane. No, we still cannot say the word bomb. There are certain trigger words that get attention, and bomb is one of them. Bomb, 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 bomb. In this particular scene, the flight attendant was very, very nice, and she let this go much further than it would it would have in real life. Take a little sticks out of your head, clean out your ears, and maybe you would see that I'm a person who has feelings, and all I have to do is do what I want to do, and all I want to do is hold on to my bag and not listen to you. We'll get someone on the aircraft, something very similar to this, saying, oh, I swear my bag fits. It will fit. It always fits. It fit in the previous flight. The only way that I would ever let go of my bag would be if you came over here right now and tried to pry it from my dead lifeless fingers. Not everybody is there to get you or is against you. This happens more often than people can think. Pilot schedules. LA to Vegas. What's your problem, man? My problem right now is I'm talking to an overrated hack whose stick work is pedestrian. What did you say? So basically what he's trying to say is you're not that good of a pilot. That is a big insult for a pilot. I was never serious about taking over this godforsaken flight. I mean, come on, Dave, look at me. I fly international. There is some unwritten prestige involved. The pilots who come off an international flight, somehow they have to just say, hey, I'm just coming from London. I just landed from Paris. I have done that and I see others do that. So it's there. I fly international. Okay, stop calling it international, Steve. And let's call it what it is. It's Canada. He's actually right. For the purposes of airline international pilot schedules, Canada is not considered an international destination. Neither is Mexico. Well, it counts. They have their own money. That doesn't even fit in wallets. Engine fire. Air Force One. So the Air Force One is intercepted by MiGs. MiG is a Russian fighter jet. If there's an aircraft with more than one engine, losing an engine is not a huge, big emergency that is going to make you fall out of the sky. I got it! Right after that, he says, well, we're turning to the right. Moving right. Very typical response in an engine failure. There is less thrust on the right side than the left side. Naturally, the aircraft will rotate towards the right, which is happening in this case. Left rudder, you have to compensate. Pull back that number one engine. Negative, you slow down. 
You have to trim it out. Harrison Ford's first remark is, oh, should I pull number one engine back? Should I pull back that number one engine? Which is a good, good idea, like for someone who's not a pilot. However, we don't take away the power that we already have on an engine or the thrust that's being produced. Negative, you'll slow down. How we compensate for it is by the use of rudder. Left rudder, you have to compensate. Rudder is a flight control surface that controls this motion of the aircraft to counteract the nose going towards the right side, you would apply left rudder. Once you've lost an engine for the entire duration of the flight, you'll have to hold that rudder in to keep the nose like this. As soon as you release the pressure on your leg, or if your leg gets tired, the airplane will turn back towards the right again. You have to trim it out. How do I do that? The trim is just relieving the pressure the pilot has on the rudder holding it in. It's like riding a bike. Outrunning the DEA plane, American made. The DEA was using these fancy new jets that we couldn't outrun. Tom Cruise is in a smaller aircraft which consumes or burns less gas as opposed to the fancy jet that the DEA is flying. They could go fast, but we could go slow for a long time. So he forces them to come down at a lower altitude, fly slower, burn more gas. Aircraft do burn more gas when they're lower and slower as opposed to flying higher and faster. And that is why all the commercial flights are flown around 30,000 some feet. Low fuel. We gotta turn around, guys. No, you don't wait that long. If you're waiting for the aircraft to tell you low fuel, you're way behind the aircraft to begin with. We're bingo. So bingo fuel is where you would not continue what you're doing and just go and land the aircraft to bring it back on the ground. Time to head home. Maximum altitude, the crown. Me, I. <clears throat> you have control? I have control. So let's talk about how Prince Philip takes control of the aircraft from the pilot who's flying it, who's also a trained pilot. It was done very professionally. You have control? I have control. It's visually and verbally verified. It's not like I'll fly a little bit, you fly a little bit. Sir, the service ceiling for this aircraft is 45,000 feet. The service ceiling of the aircraft is a fixed definite number published in the aircraft manuals. The absolute ceiling of the aircraft is a variable number, depends on the temperature of that given day, the weight of the aircraft, and other environmental factors. If conditions are favorable, the aircraft can climb from the service ceiling to the absolute ceiling. You and I both but I can say to climb with your Do not do this at home. It is not a practice that's common. Is it doable? Yes. And that's exactly what Prince Philip is saying in the scene. The difference between the, as how fast the airplane can go and how slow the airplane can go becomes very little at that high altitude, which we in aviation terms call the coffin corner. We're currently at the very limit of what this aircraft can do. Exactly what the pilot in that scene says, we're operating this aircraft to the very limit right now. God, isn't it beautiful? If you have ever thought about flying, if you've ever looked up in the sky and seen an airplane and think, I wish I'd be there, the only one recommendation I can give you is do it. The feeling that you have when you're soaring above the clouds, that is a feeling that is indescribable. 